So I finally finished the meeting materials for component two, or almost. I'll walk you through it. Now remember Saturday's component two meeting will be 1030 to 1230. Component one is H10. And the reason that I decided to do it this way to double up um, is because this way we'll be able to use the same number of Saturdays, but give each group or the candidates working on each component two meetings per component in the fall, um, plus the canvas. So they're actually getting a lot more. I felt my conscience wouldn't let me not try to give them more since they're actually getting, not getting our very unique, very high quality face-to-face -face work. So I, I'm trying to make this virtual experience as high quality and effective and efficient as possible for them. So they'll get two Zoom meetings per component in the fall, plus all that additional um, Canvas stuff that, that they get. So this one is uh, 1030, 1230. And just as the component one, uh, there's a lot, actually more than component one, there's a lot more packed into this. And so I tried to also um, really make it highly collaborative. Now, we know a lot in the field about um, virtual learning that is poor quality and virtual learning that is higher quality. So higher quality virtual learning is synchronous, which means everybody is together, um, but it's also collaborative, which means it's not lecture. If it were just gonna be lecture, then it would be just like this, just like I'm, I'm, I'm recording and sending this video to you. And you could just record something, you know, all that you know about component two and just send it out to the candidates. But that's not what our standards say that accomplished teaching looks like. So everything that our standards say about accomplished teaching, whether we're doing it face-to-face -face or virtual, it should be true. So our standards tell us that um, we do whole group, small group, individual, um, that it, things are highly collaborative, that students are part of the learning process. Um, it's not just teacher to student, it's student to student. So all of those things I have tried to really build into this model. Um, now, having said that, it's a whole heck of a lot harder and takes a whole lot more time. And so I've spent tons of, of time on this and I'm not quite finished as you'll see, but um, if we're gonna live up to our standards and the national board standards for teaching, then we don't have a choice. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't feel like I had a choice. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And while I'm doing that, just real quickly, uh, my daughter who is at USM you know, all of her classes are virtual. She said she only has one that is synchronous. All of the other instructors just put it online. It's all asynchronous. And I'm thinking, okay, bunch of slackers. <laughs> um, that's not okay. That is not okay. She is a junior at a university. We are paying for her to be taught by a person. And so the least that you can do is schedule a Zoom meeting, a synchronous Zoom meeting, so that students can actually come to class and see your face and see each other. And so she said she feels like she's learning so much more in that course because she feels like she's actually being taught and she's actually able to see and talk to the other students. So that was just a little aside <laughs> tirade or rant but you know, I'm always furious when teachers are lazy and slack. Um, when I was in the classroom, I gave my students every second of every day all I had. I gave all I had to them. And I was always angry when my daughter's teachers did not do the same for them. So here I am up night and day, hardly sleeping, trying to put our, our um, candidate support in a virtual format. I work for USM, just like these people work for USM, 
And apparently they're just slapping some content online and expecting the students to teach themselves, which I say, well, then fine, you go quit. You go do something else, you know, whatever it is you want to do instead of teaching. So that's my tirade. I actually <laughs> was gaining time while I was trying to, to get all my screens pulled up and ready. So I am going to um, show you the PowerPoint first and we'll just kind of walk through this. And just as we always do, we start with the weight. And I, this time I put some notes down here for you. So obviously you're gonna take notes <laughs> um, because that's what learners do. And good teachers are first and foremost learners. Learners, learners. If you don't wanna be a learner, you shouldn't have gone into teaching, right? So um, the best teachers are always learning. They think they know nothing. All good teachers that I've ever met think, oh my gosh, I don't know anything. Um, and those who think they've arrived are the worst ones. So I put notes down here and you're going to just, you know, quickly tell them it's worth 15% of the total score, but that doesn't mean that you don't really focus and and do a real, you know, high quality job on it. Um, and remember, you know, it doesn't matter. You can score like real high on all the others, but if you don't score at least a 1.75 on this, you, you, you know, you won't, you won't certify. It's not like it used to be where you could score a 0.75 on something and still certify if your overall score was high. I mean, I don't want you to get bogged down uh, on this slide, okay? So don't get bogged down here, but just tell them that here's what it's weigh, what it weighs, but that doesn't mean you don't need to like shoot for that three or four. And then um, just kind of go over this pretty quickly and ask what stands out. So, something that candidates typically miss is this strengths. You know, they're always looking for weaknesses. The whole system is, is based on a deficit model which is going to be the downfall of the country if we don't all work really hard to fix that. Um, so this is strengths um, as well as needs. And then another thing that candidates often miss is this ongoing assessment. They think that an assessment is, you know, when kids sit down in front of the computer at the end of something and, and they <clears throat> use that to group them or some crazy crap that they're doing in schools nowadays, but just quickly go over this and then pull the stuff out that they're most likely to miss or just, you know, have them look at it and call out what stands out. The more um, participation you can get from them, the better. And then this slide, if they did the standards workshop this summer, they're familiar with all of the body of knowledge. The National Board calls this the body of knowledge and you can just say that you know in our profession sometimes people say well i don't know what good teaching looks like what what does a good teacher do we don't you know it's just all subjective some people think good teaching looks like this and other people think it looks like this and my principal expects to see this or that or you know whatever um, but we actually do know what good teaching looks like. There's a whole body of knowledge in our field that tells us what it looks like. And so the National Board calls the body of knowledge, uh, the core props, the standards, the architecture of accomplished teaching, and then also Atlas. I almost didn't put this here because they've seen all of this, these others in the standards workshop or if they didn't do that, you know, in the Canvas course. And down here in the notes, it says, you know, remind them that they can be added to the Canvas course and learn, you know, do a really deep dive in all of this. The Canvas course, you know, for the standards workshop, um, they can just let, let Trace, I think, yeah, Tracy, I'm just gonna let Tracy handle that. Um, but I did not, you know, they haven't seen Atlas yet. So I almost didn't put Atlas on here, but the National Board does consider it as part of that body of knowledge. And they say that Atlas lets uh, candidates uh, get a really good glimpse into how an accomplished teacher thinks. And, and that's interesting, isn't it? Because it's not 
what an accomplished teacher knows, what an accomplished teacher does, but how does an accomplished teacher think? And that's what you really get a glimpse into when you read an Atlas case. That's what candidates are supposed to be really looking at. How is this person thinking about the students, about the discipline, about the community? How does, what does accomplished teacher thinking look like? So anyway, I almost didn't put it here, but just tell them, you know, you haven't seen Atlas yet, but you will soon. Atlas is really more about, you know, uh, component three, but I'm gonna put together some things for component two. I just haven't had a minute to, to do that yet, but it's on my list. Um, so just go over this kind of briefly. And then before the candidates can really go any further in the meeting, you're gonna have to do kind of a deep dive into the five core propositions because before they can align the guiding questions to the five core propositions, they're gonna to need to really like know them. Um, so if they went through standards, they did a deep dive, but you know, it's been a few months. So this, is, this slide is a review, totally a review. But the point of this is to just remind them that um, they need to read the document closely, annotate it, memorize it, it's on the National Board website. And then each proposition has multiple parts. And in their components, in their written commentary for two, three, and four, that should say four, I don't, I'll fix that later. Um, they're gonna have to include all of this. So a lot of times people just think, well, core proposition one, teachers are committed to students and their learning. I'm committed to my students. I, I'm committed to their learning. I don't really need to think about that. You know, that's what, that's what teachers think. Uh, no teacher is going to say, I'm not committed to my students and their learning. But the National Board, it's, it's not just a vague statement. It's here's how you show evidence of that. And so each of these bullet points is how you show evidence. You adjust your practice to individual differences. You understand how students at, at, at the age group develop. What is their physical development, their social development, their ethical development, their moral development, as well as their cognitive development, social, emotional, you know, all those things. Um, and then you treat students equitably. They think that means the same. It doesn't. Understand that your mission extends beyond the cognitive. A teacher's job is not just to increase uh, cognitive capacity or mastery of some skills. Um, it's, it goes way beyond that. And so you see these bullet points for each of them. You can go over all of these if you want to. You don't have to, I wouldn't go over each one of these because, because the next thing is they're going to go to the collaborative Google doc and they're actually going to rate themselves on each one of these. And they're going to have to work very quickly, um, about eight to 10 minutes. And they're going to put a number one through five for each one of these things. And I'll put them on the Google Doc. I'll show you in just a minute. So they rate themselves and then tell them, I may call on you to explain your rating. All right. So give them maybe 10 minutes and then, you know, stop. When there's like two minutes left, you may want to say, two more minutes to work quickly through as, you know, as many of these as you can. So let me show you the Google Doc. Now I have just one of them, I, I can't remember which certificate area it is, ready to share. Um, so each one of you has a document that looks like this. This is the ELA in World Languages with Sherry. Okay, and so just as we did last week, 
they're going to sign in um, and you can add, you know, rows if you need to. I think I got them just about right for everybody. Um, and then down here, let me show you what the candidates will do here. So here's what you see in this document. What you see over here in this column is the, all the different parts of the five core propositions. So you notice it's way more than five, right? Because every core prop has multiple parts to it. And I put all of the headings from the what book, every single subhead, heading and subheading, I put them all over here, okay? So then candidates will do this. They'll put their initials, each person gets a row, adjust practices to individual differences. I'm gonna give myself a four on that. Treat students equitably, understand mission, extends beyond the cognitive. So they need to rate themselves, you know, go through and rate, appreciate how the knowledge is created, organized and linked to other disciplines. Well, I can do better with that. I can always learn more. Um, command special knowledge of how to convey a subject to students. I'm actually pretty good at that. Generate multiple paths to knowledge. I don't always do as good a job of that as I should. Okay, so you see the point here. And I'll, um, so each person gets a um, column. They put their initials. If you need to add a column, um, look at your list. I'll, I'll resend the list later. And remember, it's not everybody in your group. It's only the people doing component two. So look and see how many of your candidates are doing component two. And you want to make sure you have one candidate for each of them. Some people may be absent, but, you know, try to make sure everybody I mean, you are going to make sure everybody has a column, but the more of that you can do beforehand, the better. All right. So let me. Um, so that's what that looks like. And then after eight or 10 minutes, when everybody has gone through their column and rated themselves, then you are going to call on some people and you're going to, um, and I put this at the bottom of the slide, just call on a couple of people and say, um, so-and-so, uh, Nan, I noticed you rated yourself a three on such and such and call it out, working collaboratively with families. Can you tell us a little about that? Why did you rate yourself that way? And just, you know, call on as many people as you can. Um, now, one thing that I forgot to say, <laughs> started my whole rant about slacker teachers. One thing I forgot to say is that I strongly suggest, in fact, I'm telling you, I'm not just suggesting it, I'm telling you, walk through with your pen and paper, walk through this PowerPoint ahead of time. Now, bear in mind that it'll probably be 10 to 15 minutes before we get into small groups, because remember we start whole groups, everybody renames themselves, Tracy quickly puts them into breakouts, or I, one of us will. And then, um, so you don't have the whole two hours, okay? So you need to pretend that you have an hour and 45 minutes, let's just say that. You go through each one of these slides and your Google Doc, and you give each one of them a time, because you gotta be finished by, by 12.30. And you don't want to say, oh my gosh, we didn't get through, you know, the last two slides. That's not an option. It's not an option. You have to get to the end. It's just like when you're teaching school, you know, the bell's going to ring at a certain time and you got to change classes or you got to go home and you need to be at your stopping place before then. So time management is going to be key. Map it out with times and then stick to it. Um, you may want to give yourself a little buffer. You know, you may want to like say, start at, um, Give yourself an hour and 40 minutes, map it all out. So that kind of gives you some um, wiggle room, but keep yourself paced, keep your eye on that clock. Make sure that you're finished at 12.30. We want to um, respect people's, people's time. So let me go back to <laughs> the slides and here's where we were. They rate themselves and then down here it says call on one or two or three if you have time candidates to talk about one of their low ratings and then a couple to talk about their high ratings, okay? So um, then you're gonna go to this next one and you're going to 
explain that, you're gonna have to spend a little more time on this slide because you're gonna explain that um, we're going to look at the questions, the guiding questions from our, our the component two in our certificate area. And um, these are found in the portfolio directions. And these questions, I don't know why. I think I meant to put the questions. Guiding questions, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't had any sleep. Okay, so this is important. Tell them they have to answer those questions fully and they have to answer them in order. They're guiding questions and eventually, you know, they're gonna set up, and this is all in Canvas, they're gonna set up their written commentary where they type in the headings and then they put their guiding questions in the, we're gonna have them put them in the comments and to be sure that they answer all of them. Um, so just, you know, you may want to talk a little bit about that, but the main thing is answer every question fully and answer in order because these questions are in the order of the architecture of accomplished teaching. And then we're going to get more deeply into that in just a minute. But, you know, just remind them, assessors are looking for the architecture of accomplished teaching and looking for those connections and the questions, hello, <laughs> hello, hello, hello. The questions are put in that order to elicit from the candidate the architecture of accomplished teaching and the propositions and the standards, okay? So then you remind them that the architecture of accomplished teaching is totally aligned to these five core propositions that we just went over and the rubric. The rubric goes directly in the order of the architecture of accomplished teaching and the questions. If you lay the questions and the architecture and the rubric side by side, you can just follow. You can just follow. It's just totally, totally aligned. So, uh, you know, explain that to them. Um, and then the portfolio directions will list the standards for their certificate area. All right, so after we spend a little time talking about this and how important it is for them to really, 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 really know this architecture and the propositions and the rubric and the standards, you can like give another plug for them to contact Tracy and be added to the Standards Workshop Canvas course because there's a module on each one of these. Um, but then move on into this collaborative, uh, there's one more collaborative document where they start to put all of this together. And I'm gonna show you this um, part. It's in the very same, um, e everything for your certificate area is in the same collaborative document and it's linked in the agenda, just like I linked last week. Candidates just click on, um, in the agenda, their certificate area. And so let me share the collaborative document again. We'll go back to the same one. So just to review, they sign in, you start going over the slideshow, which is linked there. You let them talk. Remember, we're using a standards-based instruction here. Um, so this was the first collaborative document where they type their initials and then start rating themselves on the five core propositions. And this is the second one. Now collaborative document two, they're going to read through the guiding questions and they're going to think about, okay, this, this particular question, what step of the architecture of accomplished teaching does this question address? And I put the steps here and then which core proposition would you provide evidence for in that question? And it may be more than one. And then column four, where do you see the standard? So here's what you're gonna need to do. So every one of you has a document like this and it's in that folder that I shared with you. I do not have the time 
to go through 15 certificate areas and paste the guiding questions here. So you're gonna do that. So you're gonna open the, uh, you're gonna go to the National Board website, find, so Sherry would find ELA component two and open that, the portfolio directions. And then she's gonna like just copy all the questions and paste them in this column, okay? So this column obviously is gonna get longer and longer as you, you know, as you paste questions in. And so then this question, which step of the architecture of accomplished teaching is it addressing? Which core proposition is it addressing? Then also up here, when you open up your um, component two portfolio instructions, you're gonna see that list of standards, remember? So this, everybody has this note to paste those standards here. So you'll delete the note and you'll paste the standards. Don't just put that Roman numeral, put the name of the standard, like knowledge of students, um, assessment, you know, whatever the standard is named, put it there. And then candidates will be, y'all will be able to have a whole group conversation and you can go through the questions one by one. And then, you know, what I would do if it were me, I would, I would call on a volunteer to read um, the first question. You wanna make it as collaborative as possible. So call on one of your candidates, you know, or call on a volunteer to read that first question. Then I would say, can, you know, can I have um, uh, somebody um, volunteer to type in the document? Um, because you don't wanna do all of it because that's not good teaching. So you, you want as much interaction and participation as possible. So I'll just model this. So let's say, I don't know what the first question would be, okay? So you say, okay, where are we now on the um, architecture of accomplished teaching? Where are we? And you know it's gonna be step one. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so what core proposition are we on in this question? And then which standard aligns with this question? Maybe more than one, right? Remember, you're going to have to kind of tell them all the places where they can put core proposition five. They're not going to say it right off. They're, they're not going to remember that. But they're going to, when they start to work and type their written commentary, they'll have this that they can look back at and remember, oh my gosh, I need to put evidence of core proposition five here. I need to put evidence of standard so-and-so here. So you're going to facilitate the conversation but you're going to have them like respond. It, it's going to be a conversation among them. So what I would do is again, I'd say, hey, Lee, will you read question number three? Um, Lee can read the question and then, I, then you can say, all right, let's talk about this. Can, uh, let's think a minute, give that wait time. Uh, can somebody tell me where are we now on the architecture of accomplished teaching? Which core propositions could we put in here? Which standards can we put evidence of here? Okay, so then by the time you get to this last question, which this column is gonna be really, really long. And when you get to that last question, you can um, then say, all right, let's look. Well, we got all the way through the six steps of the architecture of accomplished teaching. We saw where we can put plenty of evidence of all five core propositions. We saw where we could put plenty of evidence of the standards. Now, I wanna say something else right here. For most of you, this is gonna be fairly simple. For some of you, you have more than one certificate area. You have to have, so everybody can work, it doesn't matter what certificate area they are. So like, I'm gonna give as an example, Lee and Tracy's group. So Lee and Tracy have CTE, music and PE. Everybody can work together in collaborative document one. Not that way in collaborative document two. You're gonna have to copy this table and do a different document for each certificate area. 
So Lee and Tracy would have one for CTE, one for PE, one for music. The guiding questions would be different, obviously, in every certificate area, and the standards are different in every certificate area. Sherry is gonna to have to copy this table for, so that she can have one for ELA and one for world languages. Now, obviously, obviously, you, can't, you don't have time to facilitate both of them. And PE teachers aren't gonna give a rip about listening to the music teacher one or the CTE. World languages teachers aren't gonna care about listening to ELA. Nan and Jennifer, Nan has uh, English as a new language and with the exceptional needs. They don't wanna hear each other's. So y'all can get together and think about how you would do that, but I'm gonna tell you how I would do that. I would start out just the way I just said. I would say, okay, I tell you what, let's just start with the world languages, okay? Let's just start with the world languages. And um, let's just go through uh, three or four of the questions together, okay? And even if you're not in world languages, you can learn from this. If you're ELA, you can learn from this. So, you know, Sherry facilitates that conversation. And then you say, Okay, guys, I'm going to give y'all about 10 minutes um, to in your certificate area. Just start typing in there and let's just see. Let's just see what happens. Okay, let's just start kind of working together to fill it in. Now for that, they're going to have to kind of mute themselves. Then after the after they're filled in, you may have to say, hey, we have two more minutes. So work a little more quickly. Then you can come back together and, and look at trends and patterns. You can say, oh, so what we're seeing here is these steps of the AAT, it's gonna go like right in order from um, step one, two, three, four, five, six. The core propositions, not that way. It's not necessarily one, two, three, four, five, because five is everywhere. Knowledge of students is all through there. Um, knowledge of subject and how to teach it and managing and monitoring learning are all really in, interwoven, you know. So point that out. Oh, look, I, I noticed that I have a lot of two and three on the, on the same question. And then the standard, you know, point out trends and patterns. So to review, if you have more than one certificate area, you're going to have to have more than one collaborative document too. And you're going to have to do the collaborative conversation differently if you have more than one certificate area. So everybody, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to need to go into your document, your collaborative document for component two, look at those highlighted parts, put in the standards, put in the guiding questions. Everybody has to do that. Nan and Jennifer, Sherry, Lee, and Tracy, I think that's all I'm looking at my notes, have to add additional collaborative document twos. And they have to do a separate set of standards and questions. Okay. And then they have to um, facilitate their discussion differently. Okay. So now let's go back to the PowerPoint. Remember, you've got to go through, sit down and like make yourself a schedule from um, 1045 to 1055, this slide, but from 1055 to 1102, this slide, you know, think it through in your head, just like we do as a teacher every day. I never planned a lesson that I didn't go through and say, okay, this should take about this many minutes, this, this many minutes, this, this many minutes. Now within that, you modify and adjust. That's what good teachers do, but it's not okay to leave them at a point where they're not finished, right? You had a goal, a place that you were getting to. And so it's gonna be the same thing here. It's not an option not to get through all of these slides. So let me share my screen again and we'll go back to the slides and see where we are. So they've done this collaborative document. 
Um, I put, you know, in every every Canvas module for two, three, and four, I put a, a page that says a closer look at goals. Um, you, you may want to just do a, you know, a quick hit on this. Um, and then here's the homework for the next meeting. Remind them to, I have notes down here, remind them to continue working on the component two Canvas module pages. And by the next meeting, they need to do the next assignments uh, by the next component two meeting, which is a month away. So they have plenty of time. And then of course they'll have some assignments, you know, before the January component two meeting. Um, but here's what I decided that they need to do. They need to continue, you know, working in today's collaborative documents. They can look back at all that add some notes in, if, you know, if you don't get finished with any of that. They're going to choose their students, you know, some certificate areas, you choose one, some two. Decide on the goals. And then in Canvas, in the component two module, they're going to upload their instructional context and their goals. I am working really hard. If you go to Canvas right now, you don't, you won't see this. I'm working really hard to have this done. I have this note here. It says I'm actually still working on this. I'll try to have it finished by Saturday. Okay. Um, because I'm working on a whole lesson on the instructional context, you know, how to write it um, with some examples of some good ones, an example of some not good ones. And then I'll do a little more on goals. And so that's the end of the slideshow. But right now I want to say a little bit more about goals. You know, every year I add a little bit more uh, to the goals, to explaining goals. And I, I do want to say this. So we are held to high ethical standards um, in the World Class Teacher Program. We are absolutely not to do professional development that gives candidates evidence. Our expertise is in the assessment process. We are supposed to deeply understand that this is a high stakes, highly secure um, assessment. And our job is to help them understand the five core propositions, the architecture of accomplished teaching, the portfolio instructions, the rubric, um, share Atlas with them, we cannot do professional development with them that because that would be improving their practice that's not our job we would be crossing an ethical line if we improved their practice remember what we bring to the table is our knowledge of the assessment what they bring to the table is their strong instructional practice if they don't have a strong one if we beef it up we've cheated so we're not going to do that at USM's World Class Teacher Program. I cross some lines a lot and I worry about it. And sometimes I have to dial it back. The reason that I often cross a line without intending to is because, and that's why I have to keep myself calibrated and mentally focused and disciplined. But the reason that sometimes I, I make a mistake is because number one, I'm a teacher. So we think of ourselves, you know, teachers, we think of ourselves as uh, teaching people things to build their capacity to do something. And so obviously, if we see that a teacher doesn't know how to write a goal, we're going to be like, oh, well, let me show you how to write a goal. I'm a teacher. I'll teach you how. Writing a goal is part of an instructional practice. If they don't know how to write one, first of all, where do they go to school to be a teacher, right? <laughs> um, second of all, the things that the National Board has provided for them, uh, resources on how to write a goal is plenty. It's enough. It's almost crossing a line. They give them access to Atlas. You know, they, uh, every candidate has access to, to four or five Atlas cases. They can look at the goals. They can look at the goals there and see them. Um, we have given them resources on goals. We've said, this is a goal, this is not a goal. This is this, this is not. Um, it's just like when we get to component four, 
And I explained to them that when the National Board says assessment, they don't mean just summative end of unit standardized assessment. The standards give these examples. The standards say this. As a support provider, I can point that out to them. What I cannot do is if they say to me, hey, I noticed that it listed um, here um, reflective journal or um, is a form of assessment or uh, portfolio or project-based assessment. These are all forms of assessment. I don't know what that is. I can't say, oh my gosh, I do. I'll put together professional development on that and teach you what that is to improve your practice in that area. I can't do that. So with goals, I know it keeps coming, I know it keeps coming up and I'm trying to explain why, once again, why we've done all we can do um, without crossing a line and providing them with a teaching practice that doesn't exist. So um, it would be the same if we helped them choose a unit. That would be crossing a line. We could never, ever do something like that. If they make a bad choice, it can't, it's not our fault. Um, and so I know that it's our teaching spirit and, and for me, I can assure you it's six million times worse than it is for you because I am also a professional developer. That's my other job. And that is just, it's not even what I do, it's who I am. I build people's professional capacity and build people's instructional capacity. So yeah, I know they don't know how to write goals. I know that. I've done every single thing I can without crossing a line. Now I could do a whole professional development on goals. I could build their capacity to write a goal. That's not my job as a PLF. In fact, I am breaking the trust of the National Board if I do that as a PLF. So I just wanted to say, um, I'm, I hear what you're saying about goals. And believe me, I've done this for 20 some odd years and nobody knows more than I do that they don't know how to write goals and they don't know how to choose units and they don't know how to do this and they don't know how to do that. And when I say they, I'm not talking about everybody, but I want you to understand, I know that. But ethically, I can't and you can't do anything more about it than we've done. So um, I just wanted to say that because component two is the first time, you know, where they're expected to like actually write some goals and design some instruction um, to go with it. So encourage them to, to visit Canvas and that closer look at goals and there's some resources there. I'm gonna do a little bit more before Saturday, but at some point we've done all we can do and our comfort level at crossing a line should be really, uh, we should be at a high level of discomfort at cross, about crossing an ethical line. So uh, take care of yourself. Don't forget to go into your Google Doc and add the guiding questions and the standards. You might have to duplicate that Google Doc, uh, that table before you do it. Um, and get your notebook out and decide how much time on each slide. If there are two of you in a group, you may want to do that, talk about that together. Um, so I'll see you Saturday and please email if you have questions. Some of you emailed this morning to point out some things I've messed up on. I'm telling you, I've looked at this stuff so much. I have totally neglected my other job and I have a majorly, majorly important project that I have, I, uh, I'm unforgivably behind on it. So uh, it's not gonna hurt my feelings if you point out that, hey, you messed up like something major on slide number or whatever, because I, I don't doubt it. I have tried to look over it and over it but I could have missed something. So, um, all right, I think that's it, component two. <laughs> and again, it's not our last component two meeting um, this semester. So we don't wanna overload them. We don't wanna saturate them and get them so overwhelmed that they drop out. That's, that's not what we wanna do. We just wanna layer on a little more complexity each time we meet with them. And so I hope that's what, that, that's what we've done here.